Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to, to everyone. Uh, as Mark says, R2R is a, a conversation, not a lecture. So we really wanted to kick off the conference by hearing from you as the as the delegates. And we've also got, I think, potentially the most far flung of our delegates, uh, Danny Kingsley, with me to, to run through the polls. So really great to have you here, Danny. Thank you, and so, hello, everyone. Well, this is so exciting. <laughs> 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 what we'd like to do is uh, is ask you a few questions and just get you thinking about what's going to be on the program over the next couple of days. Uh, that conversation is going to happen you know, through on air, through spatial chat, but we also hope that many of you will be participating through Twitter. So just to kick things off, if I could ask uh, the first question to be put up. What you will see on your screen is to the right hand side of your screen, so somewhere over there, you will see a polling function that will come up with a, a question and, and five answers. So are you a Twitter user? And the hashtag for the conference is R2Rcon. So we'd like to get a sense of how many people out there are on Twitter. If you're not, whether you're signing up right now to, uh, to yeah, let us know what you think. Now, Danny, I think you've been active on Twitter already. Do you want to share a little bit about what you've been uh, preparing for people? Yes, yeah, so um, if you haven't been on Twitter up to now, you've missed out on the extraordinary, the useful uh, information I've been sending out through yesterday. Um, so we've got nine questions today and I had sent out just some background reading f f relating to each of those questions throughout the day yesterday. Don't stress out, it's okay. If you haven't done any pre-reading, it doesn't matter. It was just if you were interested. But what we will be doing throughout today, just the next few minutes while we run the poll, is the questions will go out on Twitter. And then uh, after that question, there'll also be a, a link to some information about what's happening in the conference that might relate to what we've been discussing in the question. So hopefully, if my time's right and I've got the time is correct and the right day, it should all just work beautifully. So fingers crossed on that one. I'm, sh I'm sure it will. And uh, we're going to give you 30 seconds or so for each question. I can see some of the results starting to, to come in now. So we've got 2% of people have signed up just, just today while we've been, been talking. 63%, I think, checking it, checking it occasionally. I mean, Danny, how do you find it's best to use Twitter during this sort of conference? I know you're quite active on it. I always find um, Twitter is useful well, it's for, useful for a couple of reasons, because when you're actually at the conference, you need to use the hashtag that's holding everything together. And so you can have you can have conversations while something else is happening on Twitter. But then it's also useful because later on you can go back and it's a record of a whole heap of things that happened during the session. And also it means if you've got uh, the handles of people who are talking or just people who are attending, it's an easy way of then getting in contact with them later on without having to worry about trying to track down emails and that sort of thing. So it's useful for multiple reasons. I, I mean, I'm a big fan myself. And uh, yeah, so have a go if you haven't done it before. Well, I think and I think 85% of people are, are on. So hopefully that's going to be a really important channel for us. So what I'd like to do now is go to the next question. And just looking ahead to the session that will be coming after after us, we have a panel discussion on inclusivity and we'd like to know how you think publishers are doing at improving inclusivity in academia do you see publishers really leading the way on this are they kind of going the flow or are publishers actually holding things back in terms of improving inclusivity i don't know if you've got any thoughts on this danny from some of the announcements you've seen in the recent months or, or years well i think it's an interesting question and it's not really um exclusive to publishers because I work on an editorial board, a couple actually of editorial boards, um, and the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication has been having this conversation um, sort of quite in depth and, and, and what we can do about increasing inclusivity, not just of our uh, participants in terms of the authors, but also into of the board itself. Um, and so that's not really a publisher conversation that's actually happening at the editorial level. So I think it, it, is, it is a challenging um, question, particularly when you've got a journal like that, which is quite focused in North America, as we discovered when we did some um, analyses of, of who had published, who were the authors. Um, so there's definitely some work to happen there. Um, and uh, it's, it's how do we do something about this and actually in a way that can be followed up and demonstrated? I mean, it's, not, it's all very nice to have a statement about something, but what are you going to do? and how you're going to be, you know, demonstrate that whatever it is you said you were going to do, you did do. Um, so there's a whole lot of questions around that. I'm really looking forward to the conversation, actually. 
Me too. And I think what we're seeing is most people see publishers either going with the flow or, if anything, holding things back. So very few people, uh, only 3% really see publishers as leading the leading the way here. So I think it's going to be a really interesting yeah, discussion. Yeah, wonder the whole thing is back. I mean, is that, is that just, um, I, I'd say that's probably inertia rather than actively holding things back. Hmm. It's an interesting question, isn't Absolutely. it? Hmm. Not much discussion okay, happening let's on, go Twitter, on to I'd the... like to say. <laughs> oh, oh excellent. Are. You're keeping up with that as, as well. I am, so, yes. uh, I'm gonna move I'm gonna move Danny is fantastic at multitasking. I'm gonna move us on to the next question. So again, looking ahead to, to something to come on the program later today and tomorrow. So Nico uh Goncharev's gonna be interviewing three experts from China on uh developments in scholarly communication in China. We'd like to know what people think uh, China's influence is is going to be on scholarly communication into the future. Is it is it going to increase even even further from where we are now? Is it going to increase slightly, staying about the same? Do we see it decreasing? You know, maybe China going its own way and the rest of the world doing uh, continuing as it is. I mean, again, China. Uh, sorry, China. Danny, any thoughts on China? Um, actually, you know, it's quite interesting coming back to Australia, having worked in the Northern Hemisphere, because, of course, we're in, in Southeast Asia in Australia. And so China is, is a very close trading partner and it's very close. We've got a very close relationship with China. Um, and, and sometimes, that you know, sometimes we have um, little tiffs as kids do, like siblings do. But um, it's uh, it's a very different relationship to China from here than it is from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so it, I, I found I really noticed it when I got over there that there was this sort of sense of other. Um, and this was some years ago now, and I think that things have moved on from there. Um, but now coming back, it's sort of it's much more familiar from my point of view. But of course, we're talking about a country that's producing, I think it's now it's outstripped uh, the US in terms of, of the production, mm. of the volume of, uh, of publications and so on. And so, you know, it's a very serious contender out there in the market. So what are we seeing and, and on our results? We're, we're seeing a, a lot of agreement with you, I think 60% think China's influence is going to increase enormously so um, I think it's already significant but yeah expectations that it's going to be even more influential in the coming years so I think those interviews are going to be really valuable in giving us some insights mm. into what kind of influence China may have. Okay well let's move on to the the next question, um, which is uh, some of a, somewhat of a thorny one. So um, rich researchers are under pressure to compromise on research integrity. Is this happening all the time? Is it most of the time? some of the time. Um, I mean, I know, Danny, obviously you worked at the University of Cambridge for a number of years. I think you were head of scholarly communication there. So I'm sure you'll have had some insights in, into this. How, how do we know what researchers are experiencing? Because I mean, people aren't necessarily going to volunteer if they're, they're not behaving with integrity. So how do we get a sense of what's going on? Well, I think there's a couple of things in this one. The research integrity question, uh, when, when surveys are done of people, the, the assumption that others are doing working poorly is higher than one's self-assessment, if that makes sense. And so there is this perception that I think is possibly worse than reality. But I, I think the, the issue we need to worry about with integrity is often we talk about the integrity of the researcher. Um, so in Australia, we have a code of conduct, for example. So it's about the way the researcher behaves. But what we really should be thinking about is the integrity of the actual research. And so in that instance, what we want to be thinking about is if we've got research that is openly available, the data can be viewed and, and you know, double checked and so on. If, 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 if the processes are clear and out in the open, the likelihood of poor research, um, regardless of the integrity of the actual researcher, is going to be lower, if that makes sense. So you, it reminds me of some of the coverage on, on COVID-19. We all think we're following the guidance, but everyone else, everyone else isn't. It's very, it's very similar in all of these different social environments. And, and I think what we're seeing, you know, most people think, you know, some of the time researchers are, are under, under pressure, not most of the time, not all the time, but very few thinking it's, it's, it's never happening. So I think it's going to be really interesting to hear more about that over the rest of the, the program. So staying with the researcher theme, I'd like to move on to, to question five, um, which is what researchers really think about publishers. So we are gonna be hearing directly from researchers as the, the program goes, goes on. Um, so I, I think, yeah, we've got some, some different views here. You know, are researchers, are publishers making the world a better place? Are they serving the needs of research, a necessary evil? An anachronism or the the devil incarnate. Uh, what do what do people think? Now, Danny, you're not 
not known as being someone who's afraid to speak her mind. I don't know what you would what you would have to say on this. Um, well, I, actually, I'm just going to go jump back to a, something that uh, Frank Norman's put said through on Twitter, and it's about publishers, but it's referring to the in inclusivity question. So um, it's just commenting that he said, I think there's a patchwork. Some publishers are doing well and leading the way, and some are ignoring it or just paying lip service. Difficult, as it's an academic culture issue more broadly, which I think is is uh, relevant here. It's um, Publishers are one cog in a very complex wheel, and actually that's that's if it's a complex wheel, a wheel's fairly straightforward, um, a web, let's shall we say, ecosystem. Um, yeah. And uh, I, I do feel that we, we, the thing that we don't have a lot of in our community is a deep understanding of how the others operate, like where other, others are coming from, the different operators. And that's one of the benefits of this particular conference is we do get different players in the system together to talk. And I think that really helps because until you do that, you don't really know where they're coming from and what the pressures are on them. We are making that um, egregious error of uh, lumping all publishers together as one community or yes. lumping all researchers together. Of yes. course, very, very diverse communities in both in both cases. But most people plumping for the necessary evil is what I see. Oh, that's, that's uh, terrible. The, the, the publishers, we love you. You're our friends. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave us. <laughs> well, quite a few serving the needs of research. I don't know what the split of publishers in the audience is, perhaps about 34% that uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll see. Okay, so I'd like to then move on to the next question. So one of the highlights, I think, of the Research to Reader Conference for the last couple of years has been the, the debate. And I know on the advisory board, we spent a lot of time thinking about what the, the right debate topic was, but we've gone for um, whether publishers should be paying academics for providing peer review. And we're just interested to know what are people expecting from this debate? Are you expecting sparks to fly? Have you got no idea what to expect? Are you going to change your mind? Are you open to changing your mind? Or is it just about having your, your preconceptions confirmed? Danny, I don't know if there's anything else on Twitter you want to you want to highlight at this point. Uh, well, there's something in the chat. Um, so uh, one of the comments from Katrina McCallum is um, in relation to research integrity, saying that she thinks researchers are under pressure all of the time, but the question is whether they act on it is is probably more of a relevant mm. question, um, which is very true. Well done, Katrina. Um, and uh, Bernie Follin has made the comment that people use Twitter less when in the conference chat. I, th I think that's true too. Actually, uh, Twitter is one thing when you're in a room, um, but when you're using a, a device it's a, a, you know a system online it's probably easy to use what what you're looking at online um, and there was another oh no I've just lost it here we are um, and then <laughs> Bernie made the comment about um, the question changing to what is a publisher um, rather than you know making them all um, <laughs> timing them all in the one yes. one pile so, so how we in go terms of the debate, debate response it's good. I mean, 43% of people are open to, to changing their mind, which I think is a is a real positive. And 25% are not sure what to expect. So I hope some of them are also open to changing their mind. So I think that's a real encouragement to our debate participants. It's it's an open field and uh, you know, it'd be really interesting to see who comes out on, on top. Should publishers pay researchers for peer review or or not, uh, that's going to be later today and I think, yeah. and I think tomorrow, so it's spread over both days. Yeah, that's right, it's spread over two days um, to allow time to, to formulate responses. That happened a couple of years ago too, actually. There was a not insignificant number of people in the audience who shifted their position as a result of the debate, so that's great. Okay, so I'd like to just move us on to question seven then. So this is looking ahead to tomorrow's programme. We're going to have a couple of sessions on, on open access books. So we'll be hearing from Me Too Lucraft, The Spring of Nature, also Martin Eve and, and Francis Pinter. I think we're interested to know what people make of, of open access books. So we've seen a much slower transition to, to OA books than, than OA journals. And do we see that as ultimately the only way forward? Are we going to see all books becoming open access? Is this just a niche option? Is it simply too expensive or a waste of time? So I don't know any thoughts on that, Danny. There are so many advantages to having a digital book. Like let's let's take the access thing out of the question out of the equation for a moment, um, because you can do things like add uh, media into the book and make it a, a sort of immersive experience, and so include sort of different aspects of the whole reading process. So there are huge advantages of electronic books, full stop. Um, there are advantages of open access books in terms of the larger readership. Um, ANU Press, which started life as Australian National University, 
started as a e-press, um, something like 16 or 17 years ago, it was a very long time ago, as a fully open access publisher, they dropped the E about five years ago and just said, we're just a press, have huge numbers of downloads, tens of thousands. Um, so the advantage of an open access book is that you do, the likelihood of you getting a larger readership is much higher. The disadvantage is a lot of people still actually quite like paper. Um, so having the ability to buy a copy of it, an open access book is, I think, would need to remain into the future. We've got 70%, I think, see uh, they've got some role. Either they are the way forward, 29% or, an, or a niche option. But we're going to hear a lot more about that tomorrow morning. So we've only got a few minutes left. I'm going to move us on to the next question. So the Coalition S rights retention strategy. Um, this has been something that's caused, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of debate in in certain circles. I don't know how many people are are familiar with this. So I have given you the option of going, huh? What's all this about? But if you are familiar with this, there's been a lot of debate about the relationship between rights retention and and academic freedom. Is this something that's giving scholars the rights to keep the copyright in their in their work? Is that enhancing academic freedom, or is it? compromising that so if you've got a got a viewpoint do let us know what you think and we're going to be hearing tomorrow from Johan Rorick who's the executive director of, of Coalition S so there'll be a lot more to follow on on this one but this is a particularly I think sort of uh, controversial topic at the moment isn't it Danny? It's certainly very uh, very topical because of the Publishers Association response was of course published not that long ago only a few days ago um, and I, I think the, the question of academic freedom is very fraught about what it really means, especially when we're in a situation where we look at what's happening in India, for example. Um, and uh, so there's, there are really serious issues in relation to what academic freedom means in terms of actual liberty of people in some spaces. And so I'm not sure that's the, the right word to be using in relation to choice of publication. But there we go. I've just probably just sparked up a whole, whole, <laughs> whole uh, debate there. But um, yeah, I think, I think what is academic freedom is itself a very interesting question. Yeah, so what we, what we hope people will be able to do is do keep thinking about these issues. You know, I know Danny's been uh, live tweeting. It would seem that you pre-scheduled some tweets. So all these questions are, are on Twitter as well with plenty of other content. Do continue to, to chip in now and over the course of the, the conference. We want it to be that, that conversation. And uh, I just like to say, I think thanks very much indeed, Danny, for uh, taking some time from Australia. We are doing a rerun of this quiz later today. Uh, I think that's four in the morning for you also, Danny, so you're not going to be yeah, rejoining I, I, for that I'm not going to be there. Sorry, guys, I love you, but not that much. <laughs> but uh, for those in, in the US particularly who couldn't join this morning, we hope they'll be able to join for the, for the rerun. We'll see if there's any differences of opinion and do keep the conversation going over the remainder of the, the conference. So thanks very much indeed um, to Anthony. everyone for contributing. Yeah, on, um, there's just a couple of other comments. Um, Anthony Watkinson has made the point that in the UK, most universities own copyright, but few researchers notice. I think you're absolutely right, Anthony. Mm. I think if you actually ask uh, researchers what's the copyright status of your work, um, you're likely to get an answer that's not actually the reality. Um, and there's a, sometimes a bit of a shock that you you don't own uh, the rights to reusing a graph that you've used in the past, for example. Um, so yeah, the copyright, uh, copyright knowledge is not great. Um, we, there's certainly some work to be done there. Absolutely. Yeah. Now yeah. I thought we I had one tomorrow... last question. We're, we're going to go straight ahead, I think, onto the on, onto the next session, I'm afraid. So we've run out of run out of time. Oh, what a but, shame. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to wrap up now and it'll be back to the timeline for the, the next session on research integrity. So thanks very much indeed. Thanks, everyone.